set commercialization, what is it and how can you use it in your own business? That's what we're talking about in this video. Every established business has what we call indirect or non-core assets in the business. These are resources a company needs to operate the business, but it can't directly charge the customer for. If you looked at your financial accounts, it would be on your uh, overheads and your assets on the balance sheet. Asset commercialization is about turning these costs into profit generators. So some examples in a construction company. The, the core service is to provide construction related services. But they have staff such as marketing staff, human resources staff, IT staff. They also have certain types of specialist equipment such as cherry pickers. In a hotel business, the core service is to provide hotel rooms as well as food and drink. But they also have marketing and reservation staff. They have human resource staff. They might have reservation software. And they might have people managing the finances. All of these are non-core to the business. A business might operate from an office building. Now, they might have extra space that's unused in that office. Or to look at it another way, most office buildings, they're only occupied for nine or 10 hours a day. The other 14 hours, they sit empty. This is an underused asset. And the final example, you might have certain assets that you use as company perks, for example, for, for staff to use. Maybe you've got a yacht that, that you use a few weeks every year. A friend of mine owns a villa in Portugal, which he bought for all his staff so they could take a week's free holiday as, as a bonus for working with him. He only has about 10 staff, so that means the villa is empty for 40 weeks out of the year. And then there's another example. I know of a charity where one of their supporters died and they left this huge manor house to the charity in, in the will. That charity now uses that building as their office. These are all underutilized assets and they have a cost to your business. In this example, the charity could, could rent a normal office building where the running costs are lower and they could commercialize a manor house, converting it into say a five-star hotel. Using this model would bring them more money in but it also increased the value of that asset. So why would you want to do this? Well, during a recession, the usual thing that happens is companies look to reduce the costs. They might sell off the assets. They, they might make them redundant completely. Or they might look to outsource them. So when you outsource them, you're paying the exact amount of, or you're paying for the exact amount of service you need. But it's a pay-as-you-go model. But the problem with this, although it probably reduces your costs a little bit, you're still paying someone else's overhead and profit margins. So asset commercialization is, a, is an alternative to those options. These are all assets you've spent time and money on developing, whether it's a property or a person or a system in the business. So why don't you just charge other people to have access to those assets? And that potentially means you can still get exactly what you need but this way, you, you're the one earning the profit and potentially getting your part for free. I'll give you a simple example of doing this in my own life. About 15 years ago, I was working away and I needed somewhere to live. I looked around and I found this really nice penthouse apartment. It was one of the nicest places in the whole city. It, it had an underground garage, it had a gym, a concierge service, and it was really private. But the place was too big for me. It had two two big spare bedrooms. So I thought to myself, I wonder if I could live here for free. And so I rented out the two spare bedrooms and I, and I basically ended up living there for free. I got the resource, but other people paid for it. This, this is asset commercialization. And in that example, I didn't have to own the asset. So how do you do this? So basically, you set up a separate new business to sell these assets through. There's different structures to do that. We've created a framework that we use, which we, we call the shopping mall framework. Right? I won't go into that, that on this video because it is too in-depth. But there's a few things you have to get right for this to work. Brand, team, customers, and resource. So let's have a look at brand. You have to create a whole new brand and brand positioning. What most people do is they'll create this as part of their existing brand. It has to be completely separate, no identifying factors, nothing that connects you both these businesses together. And I'll tell you why that's important. 
in the past, I was all involved with a construction company. It was a pretty large company. It had about 80 million in revenue. And it had quite a large team of back office staff supporting the business. So IT staff, marketing staff, quantity surveyors, architects, finance people, etc. So I suggested using this asset model and selling those non-core services to other businesses. At first, he dismissed the idea. But then about two years later, when the effects of the recession were starting to, to make an impact on that business, they decided to set it up. But they did it using their existing brand. And they gave it a different name, but they used the same style of logo, the same emblem, the same colors. It just looked like a, a business that was part of their group. And what happened is nobody wanted to buy those services. See, your customers for this will initially be those in the same sector. In other words, your competitors, or they'll be your current customers. Now, in their case, the potential customers were construction businesses, and they just saw them as competitors. So why would they buy from their competitors? The other side to that, if you're a construction business, then, then that's what the world sees your brand as. Your brand is recognized as a construction business. People don't see your brand as a marketing services or a, an IT service business. So creating a whole new brand is the way to do it. Next is team. If you want to sell those services to other businesses, First, people need to know about those services. And when they purchase those services, next they need to be delivered like a professional business. You need four core pieces to make this successful. If you don't have these four pieces in place, it will fall flat on its face and the whole process will just be a waste of time. So the leader, the relationship, the operator, and the financier. The first is the leader. This is the person that's driving it. This, this person creates the value proposition, packaging it, what the customer wants, and coming up with the offer. They, they come up with the business model, the brand, the vision, and the strategy. The relationship is about sales and marketing. Who's responsible for getting new customers, and as well as making sure your existing customers are satisfied? And remember, we're talking about this new business, not your customers for your existing business, although they might become customers for this new business later. The operator is the person that manages things day to day. They oversee any support that's needed in the new business, as, as well as creating systems and things to make it, it run efficiently and smoothly. And then the financier, you could call this a financier, or you could call it the governor, give it whatever name you like. This is the, the one that's responsible for controlling the finances and all the reporting and making sure everything is, is legal. So you know exactly what's going on in the, in the business and everything is, is right. Now, you might have one or two of these roles filled by people already in the business, but it's important this business runs completely separate from your existing business. It has to have its own dedicated management team and its own budgets. Otherwise, it's just a distraction and, and neither business will be successful. One thing I note from dealing with hundreds of different companies over the last three decades is these staff, let's say a marketing person in your business, these staff are not entrepreneurial people. They're doers. They do what's in front of them. You probably won't be able to put that marketing person in charge of driving the sales and marketing function for this new business. And the larger your existing business is, the worse that situation will be. I'll give you an example. I've met lots of marketing agencies. They're brilliant at doing marketing services for the customers, but they never use the same principles for their own business. They struggle to find new customers because they're so focused on doing rather than on the business of business. It's the same with accountancy firms. I've met so many small accountancy firms who handle the client's accounts perfectly, but when you look deeper at their own business, they're in financial distress. The way that we set this up is we step into that leader role. This is what we're naturally good at. And then we work with experienced partners for the, for the other three parts. Again, using our shopping mall framework to set everything up. And so the third area to think about is customers. Where are you going to get customers from for this new venture? Now, the intention of setting this new business up is for this to grow. The resources that you're selling through this new business, these are just the foundation of the business that we'll build on later. It's just enough to get started. Based on our own experience of doing this, we'd expect it to grow at least 10 times the size in terms of demand within the first two years. So to do that, we use a number of strategies. 
and the first customer for this new business is your existing business. It will still provide the services to you that you, you, you need. And then if it's appropriate, the next group of customers you'll target will be your existing clients. Now to use that construction example from earlier, if your clients are say hotels, then they probably need IT support. They probably need human resource support. But if you try to sell that support through the construction business, they're thinking as you, uh, of you as a builder, not as an IT business. There are also potential issues relating to professional indemnity and insurance cover as well. Could they make a claim against your, your construction business? So after you've targeted your existing clients, next we'll look at your sector. In other words, selling to those you'd consider to be your competitors. And the reason for that is because you are the customer. You know exactly what your type of business needs. So who better to sell to than the same type of business? Now, the chances are these competitors will be smaller than your business. They'll probably be the type that buy from the outsource providers because they don't have enough demand to employ full-time staff. After we target the direct niche of your competitors, then we'll target the wider same sector. So if you're a hotel, your direct niche would be your uh, uh, other hotels. But the wider sector would include, say, tourist attractions, restaurants, and other businesses that all make up that wider hospitality sector. And from there, we can start and expand into new sectors. But how we do that is to look at forming joint ventures or maybe merging or acquiring other businesses that, that already operate within those sectors. One thing that people get hung up on is why would they provide support to the competitors? And this is where you need to need a, a mindset shift. Those businesses are buying that support from someone. So it might as well be you. This is about moving from owning the customer to owning the market. This is about how Amazon, this, this, think about how Amazon operates. It doesn't say we've built this online shopping platform. Now all of you small businesses can go to hell. No, it says come and use our platform. They even work with big businesses like Morrison Supermarket, for example, letting them use the asset that they've built. This is what asset commercialization is about. Taking those assets and letting other people use them. And then finally, the last theory to think about is resources. You need to treat this like every other venture or investment in the business. If you want to see a return, you have to first make that upfront investment. The first piece of that is getting the brand and the positioning in place. Next, you have to cover the cash flow to support those existing staff and resources until it starts to get going. You're still taking the support that you need. It's just that it's now provided from a different business rather than from your original business. That overhead in your accounts has moved from being an overhead cost to now being an asset on your balance sheet. And then you'll need to make some, some form of investment to cover a marketing budget and the, to support the cash flow of uh, delivering to those new customers. It doesn't have to be huge, but it does have to be something. One thing I really hate is when people half do things. They play at doing them. They aren't really that serious about it because they, they put minimalist effort and resource into it. But then they wonder why it didn't go anywhere. I think they do this because they aren't fully committed to it. So they hold back, but that's where the problem is. It's like buying a racehorse, but then feeding it Big Macs because you can't really be off to spend money on the proper food. Well, if that's the case, it's not going to live very long and it, it definitely won't win any races. It's the same with your business. It's the same with the new business. So I'll talk about some examples so you can see how this has, has worked in the real world. So the first is a hotel group that we were previously involved with. And that business employed various staff, including uh, marketing reservations, IT, finance, and HR. And so that, that business was actually sold to a larger group. And at the same time, the people involved decided to use this model and they set up new businesses, each providing the various services to, to, the, to that group that had bought the company, but also later to other hotel businesses. 
And they chose to do that because otherwise they'd have been made redundant. They weren't needed in that business that, that, that was acquiring them. So instead, they, they agreed to provide these services as, as they were needed. And then longer term, aim to sell the same services to other businesses. The next one was our own contracting business. We already worked with various hotel groups, but we agreed with one of them to transfer their facilities management staff over to our business. Now, this meant it gave us a stronger foundation where we could provide a full facility management service to our clients. If we'd done that by recruiting staff the traditional way then and then try to sell those services to our clients, it would have taken a lot longer to recover that, that initial investment. Now, for the hotel group, for them, it was more about removing that overhead from the business. And then the final example is about staff or resources that you might think are core to your business because of the role that they play. But you can still look at them in this asset model. So I was involved with a renewable energy company and our core service was to build and supply these containerized boiler units to, to commercial customers. These were like big energy generators. But for us to do that, we had to employ two designers to design those units for us. Now, these were critical to the business, but there was still an overhead. If the business had no customers, we still had to pay for, the, for these two staff. But if we'd use this asset commercialization model with, with those two staff, we could have moved them into, the, into a new business and then created a, a new service providing design services. We'd have still used them for our own needs, but by selling those services externally to other people, it would have given us even more design capacity as eventually we'd need to employ more designers in that, in that new business, which the profit made from that business would, would have covered the cost of our own needs. Plus, we'd have access to more people and potentially more skills and experience as we brought those new staff in. So what happens if you don't have a, a big resource that you can use this model with? If you've only got, say, one member of staff that you could use it, this model with, it's not going to be viable because you need to employ those four roles that we talked about earlier to drive the business. So in this case, you, you do it by teaming up with other businesses. These could be your clients, for example, or, or other businesses like yours. For example, if you're an independent hotel, you might employ someone to take care of marketing and finance. But if you teamed up with two other independent, uh, 10 other independent hotels, you'd be able to set it up together. You could also look at your supply chain. Who do you buy from and who buys from you? What about your partners? If you pulled all these different groups together, you should be able to pull that resource together. There'll be an asset in every business. I know I've focused on, the, on staff in this video, but there's a lot of areas that we call assets in a business. Even your customer database is an asset. That piece of software you created, that's an asset. It's just that right now, those, those assets only have one customer, your business. You have to think about how can I increase my return on, it, on that investment? I do have one word of caution, though. People's egos get in the way of common sense. Don't try and do this yourself. I've got countless examples of when people try to do this stuff themselves, and it just ends up a mess. Use an independent and unbiased third party to put this together especially if there's more than just your business getting involved with it. This is what we do. We aren't consultants or coaches. We're invested in the end result. If we don't think your plans will work out, we'll tell you a better option. Trying to do this yourself will be a massive distraction and your existing business will definitely go downhill while you're trying to set, up, set this up and get it up and running. This is a 12 to 18 month project to get it operational and out into the market ironing out any problems along the way. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in looking at this in your own business and you want to work with us, I'm happy to have a conversation. If not, then I'll speak to you in a few years when you've changed your mind and wasted three years.